Hello everyone, I'm James, this is Larissa, and today we're going to be talking about Cape Town. Um, so how we're going to be running through our presentation is going to start with a bit of context for Cape Town. I'm talking about the existing development plans uh, and how they tie into our vision for 2050. Then we're going to be going through some of the design components uh, and we're just going to be finishing with how it affects uh, greenhouse gas emissions and Cape Town's within the type. Um, so we apologize for our uh, slide format. It's a, it's a technical issue we have to Google Drive. Um, so for, for Cape Town, it's, as you saw on the, the previous map, the southern tip of Africa. Uh, and here's some, some key stats. You want to compare them to your own cities. So the population is a little under 4 million people with an average population density of 1,500 people and uh, an average uh, GDP per capita of 16,000 uh, US dollars. The major industries are manufacturing, shipping, and tourism. Uh, as you can see, there's a highly varied uh, uh, terrain, with some very uh, nice areas and some uh, very impoverished areas. Uh, the central business di district is located here, and with the outlying territories uh, on along that region. Um, our vision for 2050 was influenced by a number of uh, development plans. Uh, there's the Integrated Development Plan, uh, which advocates densification and integration. Uh, the Comprehensive Transportation Development Plan, which prioritizes efficiency, safety, and multimodality. And we also use the Smart uh, Building Handbook, which advocates energy efficiency, water efficiency, and local sourcing. So what is our vision for 2050? Uh, the vision statement we came up with is a Cape Town that is more environmentally responsible, prosperous, and social inclusive. And to reach this vision, we do want to case studies from around the world. Uh, a similar one, uh, also in South Africa, is Drake and Sign, and we drew on that for water, water management studies. Uh, right here in Ontario, we use a lot of the case studies for phasing of uh, coal fire generation systems. And in Indonesia, we use the extensive bus rapid transit system as an inspiration for our transportation. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, buildings from two different perspectives, uh, energy and uh, water efficiency. Uh, on the front of energy, we considered two alternatives, thermal energy storage and local photovoltaic generation. Uh, this is a schematic diagram of uh, an underground thermal energy storage uh, system which can achieve up to 50% energy reduction in a climate like Cape Town, um, but it has, very, it has a high cost, and so we would expect low adoption rates in cities such as Cape Town. Um, and so we prefer the alternative of local photovoltaic generation, uh, which could, if accompanied with a, a storage solution, uh, reach net zero energy um, for residential electricity consumption, but assuming more realistic adoption rates and expenses, uh, it would achieve uh, at least 6% of all uh, residential energy as a reduction. Uh, then, in terms of water solutions, uh, we considered uh, rainwater collection and graywater reuse. Uh, rainwater collect collection is good because it's general purpose, it's pictured here in this diagram, uh, and it could reduce up to 40% of residential uh, water demand. Um, but it's also more expensive, whereas gray water is inexpensive and is less of a complicated system, so it could be adopted more readily, uh, and it could reduce up to 35% of residential water demand, which coincidentally would entirely cover needs for irrigation, which is perfect because gray water cannot be stored for long periods of time due to bacterial concerns. Um, now we look at the transportation network in, in Cape Town. Uh, so for public transit, we considered uh, the three major uh, areas. We looked at integrated rapid transit, heavy rail, and the minibus taxi system. For integrated rapid transit system, there's a, there's a bus system that's currently being phased in uh, and replacing a conventional bus system. It's called the My City Bus System. Uh, we proposed nine new dedicated bus routes, which you can see on the map here, going north of the city, south, and southeast. Uh, and with the, if we adopted this new plan, it would put 80% of the population within 500 meters of a public transit stop, which is an a international standard. That's very good. Um, in terms of heavy rail, we proposed uh, a single 
a single line extension, a uh, double track with, uh, new three, with three new stations, which would be in the southwest, sorry, yeah, southeast region, which would provide 26,000 riders uh, capacity daily. Uh, and lastly, Cape Town is, is kind of interesting in this, in this regard. Uh, it has an extensive minibus taxi system. Um, and it's, it's a very unreliable service. It's, it's not official. It's just people uh, running around in uh, private vehicles, which can uh, accommodate like a few people. Um, so that's not a very dependable source. So we didn't want to emphasize that. But that can provide an additional 20% uh, capacity for the feeder routes that feed into the, the main system as well. Um, in terms of non-motorized transportation, we were looking at cycling and walking. In terms of cycling, we wanted to prioritize creation of new facilities, increasing the safety of existing facilities, um, and integrating it with the IRT uh, bus system, which has been done in pilot uh, projects and has seen a lot of success so far. In terms of walking, we wanted to upgrade the existing facilities. Uh, currently, there's many streets that only have one sidewalk, or they're very narrow, or sometimes both. Uh, and we wanted to improve the walkability of the city in general, which we did through land use, which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so Cape Town originally was a, a radial city. So with the city center here, and then veins running out uh, towards the suburbs. Um, and that was because it was a port city. Uh, and as you can see on this population density map, there's all these highlights here where we're seeing new developments. And so what we want to do is we want to in our vision for 2050, we want to connect them and make it more of a polycentric city. We're going to do that by uh, connecting them with mobility links and having land use intensification at those urban hubs. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about neighborhood design. Uh, on the left, if you can see them, it might be a little hard to see, but they're, the layouts, uh, these are existing neighborhood layouts we found in Cape Town, and they're very varied. On the top left, we have a rectangular block layer. Here we have uh, integrated uh, green space. Uh, this one <laughs> is a, a looping layer. And on the bottom right, we have like a, a bit of a jumble. It's a, that's, that's uh, a neighborhood in a slum. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was we wanted to rework the, the, the neighborhood so that they followed something more like this one. So this is a densification along an arterial road. Uh, and with that new breakdown, we would, we would come up with 60% of space being devoted to building footprints, 35% transportation, and 5% green space as an approximation. Although it's, it's very hard to say uh, with certainty because there is no such thing as a typical neighborhood in Cape Town. It's a, it's a city of suburbs. Um, the, the other thing I want to talk about in terms of neighborhood design is what the priorities are. So we want to promote access to uh, activity hubs. We want to encourage active modes of transportation. And we want to prevent violence, which is a, a really important social benefit. Uh, now, this is a, this is a map of uh, a slum in Cape Town. And these highlighted areas are areas of uh, increased uh, violent crime. And they were targeted in a, in a study. And here's, here's a, a transition. So this is going from like what was a, an illegal uh, dumping ground to a playground. And so that is the sort of thing that we want to uh, make use of in Cape Town. And I'm going to hand it over to Larissa, who's going to talk about energy. So now that James has introduced to you our vision for the different sectors, I will begin by talking about the impact it has on energy, water, waste demand, and supply projections for 2050. So the 2015 State of Energy Report actually projects the annual energy use for 2012 as 156 million individuals. That's shown at the start of the point over there. And so you can see that the projections using the vision in your energy report for 2040 scale to 2050 uh, shows expected demands of 400 million, 450 million for business as usual, and then optimized energy future around 300 mi uh, million individuals with the implementation of our strategies that we presented earlier. So the first issue that needs to be addressed is how to manage projected growth. And so we can increase the capacity of supply. However, demand management is more sustainable. So this includes implementing the green building innovations that James spoke about earlier, and also addressing transportation as it accounts for the 64% of total energy consumption in the previous graph. 
solutions such as alternative fuel vehicles, HOV lanes to reduce uh, or to increase car occupancy, and land use measures that like justify areas of economic activity, allow for like reduced travel time and distance, which improve access to public transport. So the second issue that needs to be addressed is the current source is coal-based electricity and fossil fuels, which are significant emitters of CO2. So the solution to this is the diversification of supply. So this graph over here illustrates how to meet the optimum energy future with the composition of these sources illustrated here. And then this graph over here shows the impact of implementing local generation and embedded PV cells. To plus the solar neighborhood and thermal energy storage options as assessed by James and how we can achieve sustainable energy growth by 2050. So this is the current water consumption profile. So the problem that Cape Town faces is that even with the storage capacity shown in the table, the dams still remain underutilized due to lower rainfall, evaporation losses, and increased consumption. So it is estimated that the Berg River Dam, which is part of the 73% uh, of water supply, will only serve the demand until 2019. So for 2050, new water sources will be utilized to reduce reliance on dams to manage supply. Water from groundwater sources, especially the Table Mountain Group Aquifer, located in the east of Cape Swan Mountain. Water recycling and seawater desalination are potential ways of accommodating future water demand. So the city's raw water for treatment will be obtained from the mountainous catchment areas. And all wastewater and storm water will be managed by the Great Water Irrigation System and Rainwater Collection that reflect these results in demand. So you can see that Great Water Irrigation System saves 32.2 uh, gigaliters of uh, water per year versus rainwater collection can reduce demand by 40, uh, reduce, yeah, demand by 40 percent. So there are three municipal land sites in operation with 2.5 million tons of domestic and industrial waste. So the anticipated changes in population growth project waste for 2050 to be around 3 million tons. So demand strategies from the UN can be implemented, which include control of waste quantity through minimization, recovery, avoidance, recycling, reuse, composting, etc. So by 2050, measures such as biogas and RDS will be significant to waste management. So in 2017, Cape Town constructed a biogas plant that converts organic household municipal and industrial waste into biomethane, which is also a, re a renewable energy source. In 2016, South Africa created its first RCBS plant aimed to reduce waste to landfill. It is expected that expansion will occur in Western Cape with a high potential for applicability for Cape Town in the next 30 years. So with all the strategies we have covered, the 2050 vision for Cape Town should reduce total GHG emissions per capita by 26%. So to know the industrial sector shows the least reduction in emissions by 2050 because sustainable industrial practices were not a major focus of the vision. So although the 2050 vision is not carbon neutral, emission reductions are significant and aligned with established carbon targets. So the values in this table tie into our model of urban metabolism for Cape Town. So the 2013 values were sourced from a material flow analysis done by the University of Cape Town, and they were scaled to 2016 using 16-year growth trends uh, given in the paper. So fast forward to 2050, this is what the UN is expected to look like. So you can see that biomass is highly dependent on population growth. Uh, as Cape Town's port processes large amounts of imports and exports, you can see that there's a huge inflow and outflow of biomass. Solid waste is also dependent on population growth. It seems that there's no imports or exports of solid waste, only domestic circulation. This is the only closed material loop. So by 2050, if Cape Town develops the short and medium term land that is planned in their spatial development framework over here, this will be, this will be a significant increase of 76% in the consumption of construction material. So after assuming that emissions is an accurate 
depiction of fossil fuel consumption, a reduction of 6% of the liquor. So with cleaner technology, this reduction will only be greater. So due to it's a time constraint, uh, I will only present initiatives that Cape Town and our vision will use to address the goal. 11 targets. So sorry, cut off. But there's the target one. Uh, it's to ensure the basic access, uh, basic services and housing are uh, are met by 2030. So the strategy to uh, address this is given in the Watching Cape Human Settlement Strategic Plan for 2015 to 2020. So by 2030, there will be a backlog of priority housing shafts of roughly 234,000. So even with the projected supply, there will be a shortage of around 67,000 houses that will be required to meet this goal 11 target. This can be supplied by the private sector. Target 2 was addressed by James with the integrated BRT system in the metro rail. 80% of the population will live roughly uh, five, less than 500 meters from a public transit stop. So Cape Town's spatial development framework addresses target three, which is to enhance inclusive sustainable urbanization and capacity for participatory, participatory integrated and sustainable human settlement planning and management in all countries. The target four, will be addressed by a few of these strategies. So cultural heritage is also addressed by the spatial development framework. National heritage, or natural heritage, is protected by the IMEP, introduces sectoral approaches to address specific environmental issues for 2020. And on a regional scale, the city has signed an agreement for the Cape Action for People and Environment. So Target 5 will be addressed with a Disaster Management Act that forms the Disaster Risk Management uh, Center Plan for City of Cape Town. So Cape Town is exposed to a wide range of weather hazards and coastal threats, including drought, cyclones, and severe storms. It poses a risk for widespread hardship and devastation. So this act provides for an integrated and coordinated disaster risk management policy that focuses on preventing or reducing the risk of disasters mitigating the severity of disasters, preparedness, and rapid, rapid effective response to disasters and post-disaster recovery. So the Kailisha Air Pollution Strategy will address the most uh, pollutant dense area of Cape Town. And Target 7 is also addressed by the Spatial Development Framework. And you can see that the green and public spaces are, uh, are envisioned in this format throughout Cape Town. And then target eight uh, is addressed by the multi accessibility grid design and development corridor in transportation plan. And target nine is also addressed by the Disaster Management Act. And target 10, uh, of building sustainable and resilient buildings is addressed in smart building handbook with a few principles of material, uh, of material selection. So after showing how the city can address the sustainable development goals presented by the UN, I hope that you can see how these strategies strengthen our overall vision for the infrastructure of Cape Town by 2050.